roughly about 10 billion score FICO scores are sold a year, right? Which is, you know, so just the sheer volume of scores which are used, right? Um, and then those scores are used in a variety of contexts across the customer lifecycle. They're not only used in terms of pre-screening to kind of help them target, hey, who should I send this credit card solicitation to or this personal loan solicitation to, right? So on the solicitation part, but also in the acquisition part. So when someone applies for credit, right, the score gets pulled. Um, and that, you know, and that is a component. It's not the most important component, um, but it is a very relevant piece of the, um, of the ultimate credit decision. Welcome everybody. I'm Mark Peter Davis, Managing Partner of Interplay. I'm on a mission to help entrepreneurs advance society and this podcast is part of that effort. On this week's episode, I chat with Freddie Huang, a veteran data scientist in the credit risk space. Most notably, Freddie oversaw the development of the FICO score from 1996 to 2015. When FICO was conceived, it was really before analytics and data is what it is today. In a way, Freddie is one of the OG data scientists, one of the original guys out in that space. We discuss how FICO credit scores work, we break down some of the urban myths about how scores are calculated, and we chat about the evolution of the data science industry. Enjoy. This episode is brought to you by Chelsea Capital. Chelsea Capital provides high quality, low cost accounting, tax, CFO, and alternative finance solutions. For those who don't know, alternative finance solutions include venture debt and other forms of non dilutive capital. They help companies scale their operations while keeping costs low. If you're interested in learning more, visit Chelsea.capital. Freddie, thanks for being on the show today, my buddy. Hey, Mark, uh, really appreciate you having me. Thank you. Very cool. Um, can we start off with you giving an overview of your background? Yeah, you bet. Um, so I'm, uh, you know, I'm a you know, credit risk expert, credit scoring expert. I spent the bulk of my professional career at FICO, 18 and a half years at FICO. I tell people the reason why I stayed there so long is that I had a very unique responsibility. I was basically in charge of the company's flagship product, the FICO score, for a, um, you know, a, a really large chunk of my career. So I felt I had the best job at the company. It's a product that impacts virtually almost, you know, a very large um, portion of the U.S. consumer population. It's a ubiquitous in financial services. Um, and quite frankly, I thought they were a little uh, um, crazy at giving me the keys to the kingdom. Um, but it was, um, it was a responsibility which I really treasured, one that was really valuable, loved it. Toward the end of my career, as much as I loved my job there, I felt the opportunity cost of staying at FICO was, too, was just too great. And so then I started, uh, you know, I started putting my feelers out. And so uh, I went to an analytic consulting company for two years. Um, and before I latched on to a, um, a small lending company called Freedom Financial Asset Management. There, I headed up credit risk for about three and a half years before I moved over to uh, Freedom Debt Relief, their sister company, focusing on um, the debt settlement industry. Um, and within the debt settlement industry, what my main focus is now is um, heading up all the research that demystifies uh, debt settlement um, you know, uh, such that it'll, it'll lead to more productive conversations with uh, consumer advocates, regulators, uh, creditors, and whatnot. So, uh, yeah. So, in a nutshell, that's my journey, Mark. That's awesome. So, uh, sounds like if I have it right, twenty, thirty years bouncing around, kind of credit scoring, credit risk management. Yes. Awesome. Um, I want to jump into FICO. I mean, obviously, that's a, the, the big name. Everyone. It's a household name at this point. It's been around for a long time. Would you mind giving a little overview of the company, kind of what they do, what their role is in the world? Yeah. Um, so, you know, FICO is, most, um, is best known for, their, um, for the FICO score, which is, an all, you know, which is a general purpose kind of uh, credit risk assessment, right? Score that goes from 308, you know, 850. Um, higher the score, the better. But basically, it provides lenders um, 
a, you know, a means to assess the credit risk of an individual. FICO is also uh, produces a number of other products. They have a, you know, a suite of very strong fraud solutions. Um, but by and large, um, they are most well known for um, their FICO score, the credit score. And so what they're doing, just in a nutshell, to make sure I have it, is they're gathering data on everybody, I guess, at least in the States, from a variety of sources, crunching the data, coming up with a score, and then selling access to those scores to organizations that are lending money. Is that the main use case? Yeah, so I would amend that as follows. So FICO actually doesn't do any data aggregation, right? So they partner with the credit bureau. So um, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. Um, and the bureaus provide FICO with the data, a representative sample of the US consumer population for which FICO can model on. So FICO scores are basically built solely on credit bureau information. So these are the credit histories that are compiled by uh, the various credit bureaus. And then when a lender, uh, let's say like a Bank of America or a Chase is interested in pulling a FICO score, they work directly with the bureaus. FICO licenses their algorithms to the credit bureaus for them. And basically the way they get compensated is through um, royalties um, through the sale of the scores. Okay, so I, I've been in all the different Experian and the, the credit bureaus. And I notice there's always a small discrepancy between my score and one to the other. What's the cause of that? They, are they using different data sources? What, if they're all going through FICO, is it different inputs into the same model that they're using? Where are yeah, they so I think there's, you know, yeah, so I think there's two sources. Um, so one of the sources is that the algorithms are slightly different from bureau to bureau. Um, and that's, um, and that design is act is intentional. Basically, you know, uh, when I was at FICO, our goal was we wanted to make sure that the um, that each algorithm that we develop for a given bureau was optimized for that particular bureau. And to the extent that there are nuances in the data that are a little bit different, it it may reflect itself um, in a slightly different score. So that that that's one difference. But I would say far and away the biggest driver of any type of cross bureau differences is going to be slightly different data um, across the bureaus. You know, so for example, if you apply for a car loan, you know, um, and, uh, um, and a lender only pulls their inquiries from Equifax, well, that inquiry, you know, that inquiry is only gonna show up on the Equifax report. It may not show up on the Experian report or the TransUnion report, or if uh, certain data, certain, data furnitures only report to one of the three bureaus or two of the three bureaus, that could also be another source of differences. But what I would say is that though there are differences, um, on average, the differences tend to be small. And I would say large differences tend to be more the exception in the rule. But certainly there are differences between bureaus. Okay. Now, what is it used for outside of the bureaus? Is it, or, or is that the main crux of the FICO score? Well, I'd say, yeah, so the, the most use of it is going to be um, from, a, uh, from a credit scoring standpoint. But I would say that since um, late 90s, probably early 2000s, the, um, the consumer score disclosure business has really, um, has, has really grown. As consumers have become more aware of credit scores and the importance of credit, credit scores in their lives, right? Um, you know, there is a market for consumers to know and to kind of monitor their credit scores. Um, and so, you know, and so that, you know, that is a business, you know, the B2C business, um, you know, direct to consumer business, um, which um, not only FICO is very interested in, but also the bureaus as well. Right. There's companies like Credit Karma and that's based a little bit too, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. To, to give a sense of the significance of this, what would happen if the, FICO score went down, or if there was no FICO score today, can you kind of illuminate some of our dependencies on this number? Yeah, you know, I, um, so th these scores are, well, so just to provide some context, yeah. um, roughly about 10 billion score FICO scores are sold a year, right? Which is, you know, so just the sheer volume of scores which are used, right? 
Um, and then those scores are used in a variety of contexts across the customer lifecycle. They're not only used in terms of pre-screening to kind of help them target, hey, who should I send this credit card solicitation to or this personal loan solicitation to, right? So mm -hmm. in the solicitation part, but also in the acquisition part. So when someone applies for credit, right, the score gets pulled. Um, and that, you know, and that is a component. It's not the most important component. Um, but it is a very relevant piece of the um, of the ultimate credit decision. And then on the back end of the credit life cycle, you know, once someone is a consumer, uh, many lenders um, will pull that score just to kind of monitor the overall uh, credit health of the consumer. And also it could be used to help in, you know, kind of cross-selling, um, you know, across the life cycle as well. So now if that score were to disappear, that would, um, you know, certainly in the short term, would create a lot of um, uh, you know uh, havoc, a lot of disruption because um, because that type of you know that general credit risk assessment is needed, right? Um, I think what um, but I think what gets really interesting is over the middle or the long term is then it creates a void, like and who can fill that void in terms of being able to provide um, this general you know this general credit risk assessment. Does anyone else do it now? Or is FICO kind of the only show in town? No, there, you know, there's certainly other, like the bureaus um, uh, um, have their own score too. So uh, FICO's biggest competitor is something called Vantage Score, right? Um, and, uh, um, and they are definitely, you know, gunning for the market as well. Got it. Okay. So here's the thing that I think Credit Karma tries to illuminate a little bit for the consumer. They try to kind of atomize or distill down the inputs into the FICO score. They try to make it easier to figure out, hey, your score is down. You want to do something about it. Pay off this credit card. We give you tips. What, go, what, are the, what is in the FICO score? How is it calculated? How do you think about, you know, if someone gets a 600 versus a 700, how do you get to that? Yeah, so I'm going to first talk about a high level, and then what I'm going to do is you know, um, provide something a little more prescriptive. Um, so, you know, at a high level, you know, there's this, uh, um, there are main, five main components of the FICO score, right? In order of importance, um, there are, you know, one category that focuses on payment history, which shouldn't be a surprise because how likely someone's going to pay their bills is probably reflective of how they have paid their bills in the past. Okay. Um, there's also the, the second most important neck. That first category comprises roughly about 35% of the score. Um, uh, the second category is indebtedness. Um, that roughly uh, captures about 30% of the score. And basically, we're looking at uh, um, you know, how much money does the consumer owe? Uh, within this category, variables that are very, very predictive within the FICA score are things such as credit card utilization. Okay. The third most important category is going to be kind of age of credit history um, where, uh, or length of credit history. Um, and, uh, you know, just because consumers who have established um, a longer credit history on average tend to uh, perform or repay better than those who have not. Um, when it comes to the fourth uh, category, there's uh, something which we look at that's called uh, pursuit of credit. Um, and, uh, and so, um, not surprisingly consumers who are more credit hungry, um, who are more aggressive for shopping for credit, they tend to be riskier, um, than those consumers who don't shop for credit. Now, that being said, it, uh, it constitutes a, you know, relatively, um, small portion of the score, roughly about 10%, right? And the last category is kind of a little catch all, you know, it looks at types of credit. Um, you know, seeing kind of the mix of credit that, uh, that consumers have really, uh, you know, can provide additional information to, to help kind of refine the, um, the risk assessment there. Like, you know, so as an example, right, in this day and age where it's so easy to get credit cards, if you don't have a credit card, you know, there's a little signal there. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, and so the score kind of picks up on that as well. And so uh, and that 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 last dimension really kind of um, uh, only contributes, let's say, about 10%. Okay. So I was going to tell you, I was going to explain it two ways. And so that's the first way at a high level. But um, one of the things that I used to um, always tell um, or always 
really emphasize to our clients, particularly, you know, um, when we would give these kind of scoring seminars is that, you know, I would tell them like, listen, if there is one thing that I want you to leave from the seminar, um, there are mechanisms within the score that actually make it very clear as to what's, you know, to help explain what's caught, you know, your score. Cause every consumer is different, right? For example, you know, though payment history is really, really important. There are some consumers who most consumers actually pay on time, right? And so, you know, understanding what really drives their score is going to be a little bit different. So um, what I tell consumers is that um, with every FICO score, there are up to five what they call reason codes that are returned to the consumer that will help that are designed to help explain to the consumer, hey, why are you scoring higher? Right. And each of those reasons is really relevant. And in terms of it's um, it helps explain why the consumer isn't scoring higher and it's ordered um, in um, in value of importance. So if like the top reason is like, listen, your proportion of credit balances to credit limits is too high. Well, that's the number one reason. And, and the consumer has a very clear idea of what's causing that. The, probably the, the last thing I want to say is that for consumers who have really high scores, those reason codes are probably going to sound really picky. But at the end of the day, they need an explanation in terms of this is why you're not scoring higher. Right. I, think I have a feeling uh, Credit Karma and others pick those codes up and that's what's driving the recommendations, it seems like. I get some recommendations in there, pay down this, pay down that. I'm sure that's those codes being processed. Okay, so you said two things in there that I thought um, were interesting. Uh, the payment history. Uh, it's intuitive to me that someone who has historically paid on time for 20 years straight is likely to pay on time, more likely to pay on time tomorrow. Were you guys, w w when you guys drew that conclusion, is there, I'm presuming there was a level of analysis to find behavioral kind of patterns to say, hey, we know that this correlates with like a X percent higher probability. And then it was implemented in to the model. Is that the right way? Was that, I'm assuming that work was done, but you guys, did you go through and kind of figure out this is how each of these affects future behavior? I do a little bit of historical analysis or modeling. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There, there's both kind of what you would call kind of univariate analysis where you look at an individual variable and then there's multivariate analysis where you've got a model, you want to see how how well all these variables kind of interact with each other, right? But bottom line is, you know, is that it, it's a it's a tried and true pattern which we've seen, you know, since you know since the dawn of time, and that people who've paid their bills in the past more likely pay their bills in the future, yeah. right? Um, and you know, and, and when you look at payment history, there's really kind of three subcategories. There's severity of um, delinquency frequency of delinquency, recency of delinquency, right? And so even within a given category, there's different flavors, which, mm -hmm. you know, which the algorithm is trying to pick up, right? Um, because someone who is, um, a, you know, uh, uh, who's been recent delinquent, you know, uh, who's been uh, recently delinquent, uh, it may, um, you know, maybe they haven't been severely delinquent yet, but that that recent delinquency, that may, you know, that's a strong indication of, you know, things to come on average. Right. Very interesting. Um, I've always found it was funny that uh, actually getting your score checked affected the score itself. Ah, that is a um, that is an urban myth. So urban consumer, myth, right? yeah. So yeah. So uh, consumers um, who uh, check their scores, um, whether it be you know through Credit Karma, my FICO, you know these ver you know ver various sites like that. Um, that uh, you know in kind of industry jargon that leads to what they call a soft inquiry and soft inquiries are not included are not factored into um, credit score calculations but there needs to be a record that hey you know your credit you know your credit record was pulled for this so so the good news there mark is that uh, um it does not uh you know um that won't uh, um that won't hammer your uh, your score and what, what's a hard inquiry a hard inquiry is basically any consumer initiated search for credit. So if a consumer, let's say, responds to a, let's say, a credit card solicitation, or if a consumer, um, let's say, you know, goes to a car dealership and applies for a car loan, 
um, or if a consumer, let's say, you know, um, starts looking for a mortgage, right? Got it. You know, that is, um, you know, they're initiating a, you know, um, a search for credit. Right. And so you're saying, hey, there's a pursuit of credit here, which is a signal that they're taking on more liability, which is a signal that the person after them should think that they're less fundable because they've just taken, they're probably taking on some more liability elsewhere. Is that the, the logic is yeah. why the hard, it, the hard inquiry affects it? Yeah. It, again, what we've seen time and time again is that people who are searching for credit on average tend to be riskier than people who don't. Um, yeah. What's really interesting, you know, with that is that if you look at that variable through kind of like across the economic cycle, it, it becomes more relevant, more predictive during an economic downturn than it is, let's say, during kind of like, you know, um, good economic times. And, you know, the logic there is that, you know, during an economic downturn, you know, struggling consumers use credit as kind of like this financial lifeboat, mm. right? Um, and, you know, and that search for credit, you know, becomes, uh, you, know, um, you know, becomes a stronger signal. Another way to look at it is, is, again, is like during times of economic uncertainty, really good credit risks, they know it's like, you know what? It's not a good time to apply for credit. You know, things are pretty crazy right now. Right. So, uh, yeah. So um, that's how we would we would look at that uh, type of information. Super helpful. Um, through my own journey on the VC side, I've seen a lot of companies over the years trying to disrupt the FICO score. Right. Trying to find yeah. new ways to come at the analysis. And it seems like none of them have really set roots. Why is it so hard for new entrants in this market? Ooh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, um, I would say for a you know a number of reasons. So the um, where I think the value of FICO comes is that you know um, if FICO nowadays really kind of serves as what I would call like a lingua franca in the financial services industry, right? Um, uh, you know. Virtually everyone within financial services knows what a FICO is. And also, it means something to them, right? Mm -hmm. If you talk to a lot of investors or you talk to a lot of bankers, right, you know, and they're trying to just at a high level understand the quality of a certain portfolio, they'll, they'll you know, they go, what's your weighted average FICO, right? And so it's become a common currency, you know, for that. And to, you know, and for, um, you know, for a new company to kind of, to be able to strap it to achieve that. Very, very, very difficult. I would say that there are really kind of two events that allowed FICO to kind of achieve that status. And I would kind of also find that, um, uh, you know, that today it would be a lot harder for, you know, if there was no FICO score today and if someone had an idea like, okay, I've got this great idea for one credit score to rule them all, right? Um, I would argue it probably wouldn't happen. Um, and uh, um, and I can elaborate why, but uh, um, but I think the the two big events that um, that come to mind for me is um, I believe it was in 1995 or maybe 1996 where the GSEs essentially endorsed FICO. Um, they basically said, you know, hey, um, within um, uh, you know if you're underwriting this mortgage, um, you know we're going to need a FICO score for that, right? And that really kind of cemented. FICO really kind of put it on the map. Um, I would say prior to that, one of the other things that allowed FICO to kind of take a foothold is the fact that uh, FICO is available from at all of the three credit rep um, re reporting agencies, right? Um, and um, I, you know, so any new player would need to make have a score that's avail you know, well, available. Um, uh, widespread, um, and uh, um, and would be kind of accepted by all players. Um, and I think that you know, I I think that's a really, really, really tough bar in today's age. I think one of the other things that I alluded to is this notion: it's like, hey, you know, in in today's day and age, I would think it'd be really, really hard to create a brand new FICO score. And I think the reason why is when FICO was originally conceived, it was at a time when 
analytic where analytics really wasn't at the forefront yet. And you know, back then, you know, the, the bureaus focused on the data and a company like FICOS just focused on the analytics. Well, over time, everybody understands the value of data, everybody understands the value of analytics now. And there is no way that the bureaus are going to um, kind of give up their revenue share for something that they can do on their own now, right? They've invested heavily in developing their own analytic capabilities. They're not going to want to split the revenue with someone else. And so I think one of the things that would need to happen in order for kind of uh, um, for FICO to be supplanted is that um, you're going to need to have a data source that's better, richer, more comprehensive, more reliable than kind of the existing set. Um, it's going to need to be, um, uh, you know, it, it's going to need to also meet a lot of, um, uh, you know, scrutiny from the lenders. Lenders, you know, at the end of the day, uh, lenders pull FICO because they, they trust it. You know, they've used it over time. And, you know, FICO doesn't cut corners. Um, and it's something which they can rely on, right? And I think that's going to be, a, you know, another burden or um, kind of a barrier for entry for a new participant. And you mentioned the credit bureaus have developed their own scoring systems and done their own analysis. Uh, are those competitive with FICO in the sense that, you know, the bureaus may stop using FICO at some point? Are they, have they built their own tool inside? Yeah. So, uh, you know, so I, I would answer it this way, Mark, is that, um, so, you know, the, the bureaus definitely have their own FICO competitor, right? And, you know, if it was, you know, in a vacuum, if it was up to them, you know, um, that's what they would sell, right? They basically get to keep more of the revenue share there. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, um, it's the lenders that drive the demand, right? Mm -hmm. And so if lenders continue to ask for FICO scores, FICO scores are going to need to be, you know, um, sold. Got it. It's a bit of a brand level network effect since everyone's used to the name and trust. It's a, yep. it's a, yeah, exactly that. Okay. Um, the one of the most common complaints I've heard from people trying to disrupt the space is that using historical financial data is not the most optimal way to actually pre predict future behavior. And I think they're grabbing on to use cases and scenarios where People have gone through challenging times, but the times are no longer challenging. And there's other data out there like income or other things that might indicate that they're financially stable in a way that they hadn't been prior and therefore more likely to pay bills on time. Uh, what is your response to that? How effective is historical data in predicting the future? Yeah, so I would say that in general, um, Within just kind of the um, the field of kind of credit risk assessment, um, you know, more data as long as it's accurate data can only help, right? Um, now, um, so you, what, so one thing that you mentioned is like, well, Freddie, it's pretty obvious that income, you know, is relevant. How come the FICO score doesn't you know use income, you know? And so um, so I'm gonna first say I agree, income is relevant, right? But I would also say, but guess what? The, you know, the bureaus don't, you know, store, don't have, a, you know, um, a reliable source of income that can be used in the model. But, you know, certainly, um, you know, having an opportunity, you know, to work at a small lender as well, right? When we are evaluating a consumer, both in terms of their propensity to repay as well as their capacity to, re to repay, having verified income, absolutely critical. Right, because that's such an important part of their cash flow, right? And knowing what their, you know, knowing what their balance sheet is, right? Um, so I would say, um, again, you know, to that question, it's like, yeah, there are other data elements that are incredibly relevant, um, and having access to them can really help your decision making. Um, you know, even when I was, uh, you know, uh, when I headed up FICO score development, I never pretended that FICO, you know, that the FICO score was like, you know, um, the end all be all. It's just, it, it's one component of the decision making process, right? Um, but there are certainly other pieces of information out there which you want to include in your decision making process as well. Now, another thing I've heard from folks, kind of same vein, different argument, is that there's all new types of data that are emerging through the internet in particular. That could be a good signal. 
Uh, one of the ones that's come up that I thought was less obvious to me when I heard it, but there were some arguments for it, was the idea of looking at social or relationship data. People with larger communities of friends and other things from the, some of these social graphs. Has anyone in any real earnesty explored that as a corollary or kind of a, an indicator of ability to pay? Yeah, so uh, I'm sure that there are some people out there who, who have explored it. Um, you know, I, I would say that when it comes to evaluating new data sources, um, you know, there's a number of criteria which I go through in terms of, hey, is this a legitimate data source for me to really kind of um, to focus on? Right. And so one of the, you know, one of the criteria that kind of um, um, that I focus on is that one thing that happens in credit risk, which is very different than a lot of other kind of data science um, applications, is that in credit risk, if you deny someone for credit and you use the credit score, um, and that was like um, to really kind of drive the basis of that denial, right? You are legally obligated to tell the consumer why the score, you know, um, declined them. And as a result, you need to tell them, I think it's like up to four reasons that will explain to them why they didn't, um, uh, why they weren't extended credit. Now, um, I think what's really important in, you know, in that type of context is it's not only you have to explain them, you know, why they didn't get credit, but it also needs to be, you know, within that context, it's going to need to be defensible, right? And so are you going to feel comfortable as a lender telling someone, hey, you know what? I'm not going to give you this credit card because you don't have enough friends on Facebook, right? right. Or because, you know, you know, you know, we, we often refer to that as palatability. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just like, you know, that's just not going to fly, right? But if you tell someone, listen, we're not going to give you credit because guess what? You know, you are currently delinquent on, you know, this Wells Fargo credit card, right? Well, that is defensible, right? So, um, yeah, you know, and again, there's a lot of other criteria out there in terms of why I would consider or not consider uh, certain types of data sources. Um, but, uh, um, but as an example that, you know, that we all use um, when, when it comes to things such as, hey, why don't you want to use social media data, right? You just told me more data can only help. Um, why wouldn't you want to use it? Right. It's just too soft of an argument back. No one wants to hear that. Yeah. yeah I get it. Even if, in, even if the signal is in there, you guys wouldn't use it for that reason. Is that right? <sighs> yeah. I, I mean, so again, there's I don't know like that the a, signal um, is in there, by the way, but even if it isn't, even if it is. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, we're, we're, there's going to be other criteria as well. You know, so, um, as an example, it's um, one of the things that the, um, is if you want to comply, if you are a data furnisher, if you want to comply with the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, you need to have a dispute mechanism in place, right? And if, you know, and if a lender is citing a piece of data um, and the consumer doesn't agree with that piece of data, there needs to be a mechanism in place for that consumer to dispute it, mm -hmm. right? And so do, I'll do these other data sources. You know, so the bureaus do have processes to kind of deal with that. Right. Do these other kind of newfangled, uh, you know, um, up and coming, you know, data providers are they ready to deal with that? Right. So it, yeah, it's it, again, it's a, it, it's it, it's a different ball game uh, when it comes to credit risk. I love this. You know, this um, we ne we never made a bet in the space, and any of these companies trying to disrupt FICO. But uh, with the stuff you're saying right now prove something that we always talk about internally. It's this idea that you, know, you can take a vacuum of a situation, of a problem, and present a solution. But if you don't go to the nuanced understandings of the industry, the requirements for you know filing complaints and reconciling things, and that you would need Twitter or whoever else to have an entire department they don't have and they're not going to do, um, it just it just speaks to the important practicality of actually understanding these industries and getting into the weeds of it. You know, absolutely. You know, one of the things that I think separates kind of um, like a good data scientist from a great data scientist is domain expertise. Mm. You have to you have to know um, the ins and outs of how you know 
of how your solution is going to be um, implemented, right? And if you know the rules of the game, you you know, then you know, then you have to you know you have to innovate around that, right? Um, but you know, but I think that's like such a big part of um, of successful data science. I love that. I actually want to dive deep into the data science space, um, but I want to ask one more FICO question before we move on. Another complaint that comes up a lot is bias because of the FICO system. And the argument, I think, if I'm going to distill it properly, is that historical data is hard for people who have come up from disadvantaged positions because, hey, if they grew up poor or they had dynamics, it's it's kind of this lagging indicator that continues to hold them in their position. I understand the points before you're saying, hey, it's a significant indicator about future behavior. How do you respond to the folks that are waving a flag that the FICO score is part of a like a socioeconomic bias in the country? Yeah, so I think that's a really, um, A, it's a very complicated uh, question. It's a really thorny question. Um, but, you know, but it's something that, th- that comes up a lot. And so the way that I like to think about it is that um, at the end of the day, what I would want the FICA score to be, you know, if I was a consumer, was an impartial evaluator of credit risk, right? Um, now, there is nothing in the score. The score doesn't, you know, the score only looks at credit information. You know, um, there's nothing in there that would be defined as overtly discriminatory, right? It doesn't look, look, doesn't look at factors such as race, sex, marital status, you know, um, religion, all that jazz, right? Um, but it doesn't mean that, hey, um, is there something about, um, uh, you know, is there something in the data which provides, let's say, which disproportionately impacts certain consumer groups, right? Um, but, uh, you know, but at the end of the day, the way that I would, you know, kind of focus on it is like, you want the, you want the algorithm to be, um, to be as objective and as unbiased as possible. And we're going to get back into the bias conversation. Um, and it, you know, you cannot let it, um, uh, you know, overtly use these, you know, prohibited, you know, bases or categories. Um, but, uh, um. I always like to give an analogy, right? Is like, let's say that, um, um, let's say that I'm a math teacher and I create a math test. Um, And there are certain students who just don't perform well on the math test. My job isn't to give them, okay, you know what, make them feel better and give them all A's. You know, that test needs to mean something, right? You know, um, where that test is designed to basically assess their aptitude in mathematics, you know, whatever they're studying, right? And I wouldn't necessarily, you know, want to um, to kind of engineer that score a little bit different in order to, you know, in order to quote unquote um, make them feel better, right? Um, and you know, same thing with with the goes to credit scores, right? There may be certain groups um, who, you know, for a variety of socioeconomic reasons, aren't, uh, you know, are um, maybe scoring lower. But that doesn't mean you want to kind of socially engineer the score and change different. Again, so being kind of like a, you know, a quant or, you know, a data scientist, I always want to figure out, like, understand what's the root of the problem, right? Um, and so the root of the problem isn't the algorithm, in my you know, standpoint. It is like, what are the true barriers that are preventing these consumers to have access to credit to, um, you know, um, that will allow them to eventually... Uh, uh, you know, uh, create a credit history that would kind of put them along the happy path, right? And again, it's it's easier said than done, mm-hmm. right? Um, these are things, and you know, I know a lot of you know, probably a lot of companies that you know that you've interacted with are really focused on, hey, how do we improve financial inclusion? How do we promote financial inclusion? Um, I think one thing where there's still a tremendous amount of opportunity is financial literacy, mm-hmm. right? And I don't know about you, but like when I look back upon how I developed my own credit history, right, it was really kind of dumb luck. It wasn't, you know, out of anything. I just remember my, you know, my mom told me once, she goes, when you get to school, get a credit card. And she goes, you better pay it back every time. That was it, right? Um, But, 
you know, I think there are, for a lot of people out there, there needs to be things that are a little more prescriptive, um, where you are providing consumers not only with a product for credit, but also with the education in terms of this is how you use it properly, right? And if you use it properly, guess what, right? Um, you know, you will have an opportunity to be afforded more credit down the road, um, which becomes very relevant if one day you're interested in, let's say, buying a home. Thank you, Freddie. Um, moving on to the data science side, uh, just coming back to this. I mean, you've been a data science scientist for a long time. I think I would assume, and you know the industry better than I do, that you were a data scientist, frankly, before that was a highly popularized phrase. Before it was in vogue, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Were you using it in your own world or was it used internally or was just that phrase not even coined yet? Yeah. You know, when like I started, analytics or, um, yeah. It, yeah, it, um, it was analyst. You know, I started off as a project analyst. Right? There you go. Um, and then, you know, everything kind of focused on analytics. And, you know, back then, right, you know, uh, um, you know, the company tagline was better decisions through data. Right. Um, and, you know, virtually, you know, any company nowadays, if they want to be successful, that's got to be, a, you know, you know, core competency. Yeah, there. it's a feature somewhere. But this, this was FICO was the specialized data science company. I was outsourcing for folks at some level in this particular function. That's for interesting. Sure, for sure. Um, when did data science kind of become a phrase and a thing? How, how did the the industry and the career path evolve for you over the last, you know, decades? How does this look? Yeah. Um, I'm, first of all, I'm trying to remember, like, when did data science kind of like um, kind of was coined? Um, and I'm not sure. I don't know if it was like uh, um, like mid 2000s or so um but uh um but it, you know you know maybe it's like with the emergence of um you know the wild success of companies like you know google facebook apple you know ebay paypal you know mm -hmm. those types of companies that really you know um these e-tailers that really kind of brought it to you know the forefront um and you know um so i imagine that that was a kind of a a key development that kind of spurred the growth of the industry. Right. Um, but, but for me, it's like, I'm just blown away by all the advancements. Um, like nowadays, you know, hiring new data scientists, I, you know, um, you know, the, the kid, I say kids, but I shouldn't call them kids, but the, you know, but the, you know, um, but the people who I've hired uh, out of school, they're amazing. You know, um, you know, the, the amount that they know, um, certainly dwarfed, you know, what, you know, um, uh, what I knew when I, you know, when I graduated and I'm just blown away, um, by what they're capable of, um, and, you know, and what the industry has really kind of, uh, um, uh, um, has developed, you know, over, let's say the, you know, you know, last decade. Are there schools that are really well known for training up data science talent? Yeah. You know, I, I would say that there is, um, uh, there's probably, you know, different flavors. So, um, uh, right. Cause like, you know, data science is more kind of generic term. Mm -hmm. Um, and within data science, you know, I, I would say like, or the way that I approach it, like if I'm, uh, when, when I put together my team at Freedom Financial, right. Um, I mainly focus my recruiting on people with mathematics degrees, statistics degrees, Operations research, computer science, economics, but basically the common thread to all that, right, is like mathematics. Um, all of those disciplines, um, the unifying language is mathematics, right? Um, and that was kind of really essential for what we're looking for. But one of the things that I, you know, that I think is super, super important is that hiring a you know team that comes from um, a, a diverse background. Right. You know, so I went out of my way to make sure, okay, I've got my Bayesian statistician. I need my machine learning wonk. Yeah. You know, I need my AI guy. Right. Uh, where am I going to get that? You know what? I would love to have an economist. Right. Would love to bring that on board. Oh, I love physicists. Right. You know, how does the diverse, they're, they're focusing, yeah. How does the diversity of knowledge bases, of disciplines play together so well? Why, why is that important to you? Right. And ah, I just think that if, if, if you are faced with a really hard problem, 
um, the uh, you know the more diverse your intellectual gene pool, the better chance you're going to have to succeed. Um, right? Because like you know, um, you know, if you have a problem but everyone thinks the same way, you know, it really kind of limits you, right? And so if you have a bunch of different players who thinks about problems a little bit differently, right? Then things can get really interesting because because then they start riffing off of each other, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so to me, I, you know, again, w- when I think of building a, you know, a data science team, that is kind of what I, I really, you know, l- you know, um, that that's one of my guiding principles. Got it. If someone out there is trying to get into this field, field of data science, what should they be studying? It sounds like there's a lot of answers to that. What's the tried and true most direct path into this game? Yeah, so what I would say is it, it would need to be some type of, you know, one of those disciplines that I mentioned earlier, whether it be math, stat, comp sci, um, physics, um, kind of, but first of all, um, the first thing I would tell them is like, you got to love it, right? Um, you really got to want it. You really got to love it because it is a competitive field. Um, and, you know, um, also, I think good data science practitioners, really good coders. So they can't be afraid to roll up their, you know, roll their sleeves up and really dig into the coding, um, really get in, you know, um, really get into the data, right? Um, and you know, one of the things that I look for are people who are very um, adept at managing data, right? Is as, as opposed to th- there are certain people who goes like, uh, I'm not going to do that. Someone's going to help pull the data for me. Mm-hmm. I want people, you know, I want. I think a really good uh, practitioner likes getting their hands dirty with the data because the more you work with the data, the more you can um, familiarize yourself, the more you can uh, make observations and ultimately the more you can start making, uh, generating hypotheses and, you know, understanding things. But uh, um, bottom line is I think any, uh, uh, there's a number of disciplines. I do think, and, you know, I think different people uh, may approach it differently. I would say that um, I have a strong preference for candidates with um, uh, advanced degrees, mainly because the field is so competitive, you know, um, that's one easy way for me to kind of differentiate, you know, um, candidates. Um, but, uh, um, but yeah. So th- there's an interesting parallel I'm seeing in this where it looks in some ways like the computer scientist developer market, right? When it became super competitive in the U S we started to see in the developer side, was an increasing look offshore, right? Prices came up so high mm-hmm. in the US, there's a shortage of talent and people started looking for offshore solutions. We've got one company uh, on the, in the enterprise stack, a company called Spoke that does BPO, business process outsourcing. And one of the areas that's been in really high demand for them, and they've been growing it very rapidly, is data science, largely with staff and labor in the Philippines at a much lower rate and cost structure than in the US. Is that on the radar for you yet? Are you seeing offshore providers kind of scale up into this market? Has that become culturally accepted? So, um, so whether or not it's accepted is really kind of boils down to the kind of the, the preference of an individual company. You know, um, there are a lot of companies that basically want to keep things, or, you know, they want to generate their own IP. They want to keep their own IP, right? Um, they don't want to outsource it. Now, there are certain companies which view that, well, maybe there are certain functions which are lower value, which may be better served by, you know, an offshore, you know, source. Um, so, you know, so I think there's a spectrum there. Um, there's certainly, um, you know, uh, uh, there's certainly talented, uh, there's talent internationally for sure, right? And it's, again, just like anything, um, you're, you know, you need to find good leadership. Um, and you know, you, you also, um, you know, uh, can't be an absentee landlord when, uh, you know, when you're working with them, right. You, you need to be, uh, uh, you know, provide them the right direction and the right guidance. This is the exact same narrative I was hearing in 2006, 2010 to 2010 around development, right? There was a spectrum of tolerance for offshoring. Uh, a lot of venture firms at the time when I first started in this business were extremely allergic if a company showed up and they had any you know outsourced talent on the dev team it was unfundable 
And now yeah. it's all but commonplace in startups, right? I think there's a consensus that you need to have a CTO, VP engineering, someone sitting in your team to oversee it, to make sure everyone's speaking the same language and there's good leadership to your point. But the, um, the pattern has been an increasing percentage of outsourced resources. I wonder if we're going to mm -hmm. see the same thing here. Um, yeah. Cool. All right. I mean, in all likelihood, yeah, we're probably seeing it to a certain degree. And um, again, the uh, um, the revenue pressures almost make it um, uh, mandatory to explore it. Yeah. yeah. You have to at one point. Okay. What does the data science industry need, right? For folks listening that might want to roll up their sleeves and start something, how could this market yeah. be improved? Well, first of all, I mean, just the, um, the stuff that, they're, you know, um, what the industry has come up with um, is, you know, something which continues, um, you know, to impress me, um, blow me away. But, but one of the things, you know, it, it, you know if I were to be um, kind of an armchair, you know, critic of this, you know, I would say, you know, with all the, you know, the speed and advancements that have been introduced in data science, I'd like to see a greater degree of self-policing in the industry. Mm, around what? Um, you know, uh, you just ensure it's like, you know, just because you can do something, should you do something, mm. right? Um, and, you know, you know, and so I wouldn't consider myself an AI expert, but when I read about these conversations about like, well, you know, um, about the potential dangers of AI, right? Well, um, what is, you know... Uh, what safeguards do we really have in place to, um, you know, to prevent these kind of horror stories, you know, from actually e even happening, right? And just from a business perspective, right? The way that I look at it is like, change is inevitable. I, I get that. But you always want to change in your own terms. And I think one of the worst things that can happen for any industry, right? Or one of the challenges, uh, it's probably a more diplomatic way of saying it, is that if, uh, you know, if they start to get regulated, well, if you regulate yourself, um, and you know it's not just lip service, you know uh, uh, the, the likelihood that you're going to have to face you know those types of headwinds probably going to be less, right? Um, and you know at the end of the day, you want to do it because it, it's probably the right thing to do. Um, but it's always hard because I know you know all these companies want to focus on hyper growth, and you know and sometimes you know these may be kind of competing objectives. I got it. Well, look, Freddie, hey, it's been a joy. Thank you for shedding so much light on this space um, and being on the show today. Yeah, absolutely. Really appreciate you having me, Mark. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great time. Thank you. Well, FICO scores might not be rock and roll. That was super helpful for a tech nerd venture investor like me. Uh, we see a lot of stuff in and around the space, understanding the underpinnings of the logic and how to think about the industry barriers is very, very helpful. Hopefully, if you're interested in data science, it was useful for you as well. If you like what you heard, please hook us up with a like or a five-star review. And feel free to share with a friend. You can find me on Twitter at MPD. And to hear more of my conversations with innovators, subscribe on YouTube or any major podcast platform. Just search for innovation, Mark Peter Davis.